you a couple of projects that we've done, and some of them very recently, like the TSA thing. The reason I want to do this is so the, the title of my speech is The Power of One. What can one person accomplish? I'll tell you, the, um, we're going to be hearing tomorrow morning from Gary Franchi, and uh, he has a new social network that he's created called rtr.org, restorethorepublic.org, and it's kind of like um, um, activist Facebook. And the idea, Gary and I have been friends for a long time. He and I were co-MC uh, of the Revolution March in Washington, D.C., he and I have spoken at or given presentations at several different conferences across the country. And he's a very great activist. And he and his wife reminds me of my wife and I, you know, for a long time we've been doing this. And we, we go down a little bit different path. I think you can turn me down a little bit, man. I'm, I'm loud. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is there is going to be a test that we're going to do. Imagine you have an activist social network like RTR, and what would you think that you could accomplish as a, a tool for what? If we were going to take a social network work like that and give it to activists that understood the power of uh, uh, focusing on any kind of idea, do you have to direct it? Would, would you bring it together and then say, you know, this is the, the project that, uh, you know, we have decided and I've decided or somebody decided and that's what we're going to go do? Or... Would you go, you know, I would just uh, throw the mud on the wall and see what sticks, which is the bigger clump? You know, I mean, you, you have this uh, kind of these, these trains of thought that go out through marketing and advertising and you know, propaganda and focus groups, and they, do, they use this kind of thinking in order to be able to see what's popular. Well, if you do that, then what might be popular may not be something that's forwards freedom. It might not be something that I want to have anything to do with. But if I direct it, if I say this is what I want, well, you know, is it really you're advocating for freedom? Are you advocating for a spontaneous order out of chaos that really has a big movement? And it's always been, this is why when we did the Ron Paul Revolution, that I was very clear from the very beginning that I never wanted to have anything to do with Ron Paul's campaign. It wasn't about the campaign. It wasn't about voting. It wasn't even about Dr. Paul. It was about his ability to articulate a clear libertarian message. If you build an infrastructure, if you provide an opportunity, or something as simple as a graphic... You have love illusion. If you can let people express themselves in such a way that it makes their intentions very clear about exactly what it is that they want and what they don't want. They wanted a, a, a total change, a revolution, a revolution between the ears, but without violence. They wanted to do it with love. Love is a powerful influence. It is an influence that has much greater lasting memory power. It's, I'll give you an example. I have four children. Two boys, two girls, 21 to 25. I remember the birth of each one of them probably better than my wife. For some reason, when you're in pain, when you have some kind of negative, I mean, it's just, you know, cursing you and you did this to me and all that kind of stuff, right? Afterwards, you know, they remember they were in pain. They remember the discomfort. They remember, you know, like, you know, whatever. But all that starts to go away. Their memory, it just kind of like gets erased somehow. They may remember that they had pain, but they don't remember the pain. They remember the love. They remember the good part. They remember the joy. They remember, you know, I remember how mad, you know, and how much pain she was in. Man, it is all focused on me. Because I remember, you know, they had a TV in the room. And, you know, so I think MASH was on or something, and she's like, she's going in the control, and I'm kind of watching the TV, and she's like, over here, I'm making, you're watching TV, you're not supposed, you're supposed to be watching me. 
Well, I remember this. I see the power of good. The power of, it's the way we're hardwired. If you go in preaching and hammering on the negativity all the time, you don't get lasting change. You don't make people feel better about whatever it is that they're doing. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of how it is that we use the Freedoms Phoenix Workshop. A lot of you may not know that the size of this room is pretty big. If you are, it's a little bit longer and maybe a little narrower, but our workshop is about the size of this room. We have a video studio that we do video work in. We have a control room. All the wires, a lot of our equipment is here that controls the video and the radio studio. We have a complete radio studio. I mean, we got all the goodies. We have here in the back room over there, Mark Stevens is doing his radio show live with our remote equipment. Yesterday, Adam Kokesh did my show live. He guest hosted for me because I had stuff to do. This equipment was what we were using when Obama came to Arizona and we had the black man with the gun out, right? So for, you know, how much did we get just by having the ability to go out and do live remotes? Heck, man, we were all over the planet. I was on CNN. We did the interviews. We do all kinds. Of, because we had the equipment, the infrastructure, the ability to express ourselves in a wide way. These signs that you see here, we come up with an idea, we put the graphic in the computer, and we just project it with a digital projector up there, and then we trace it out on a, a vinyl material that's not much thicker than this stuff, on a vinyl material, then we cut it out with a uh, razor blade, a hook knife, and then we just put it on this any material, there's the back of... Uh, freeway banners, you know, the big billboards that you see, they eventually have to throw them away. During the 2008 presidential election cycle, heck, man, they were like paying us to haul them off. Because in Vegas, they had to pay 5 to $10 a piece just to throw them away because they have a seven-year life cycle, you know, before they even start to degrade. And they never really do. So we go, you know, because we love you, pays. We'll haul them off for you for nothing because we're nice guys. <laughs> they couldn't give us enough. We had, you know, all the guys remember, man, they're heavy too. They're like a 800 pounds a piece. We had trailer full. This entire stage, we come back from Vegas, we'd have to take multiple trips. We'd have this high, this entire thing full of just billboard banners. Then we cut them up in the 4x8s or smaller and whatever and remnants of different pieces, and we would make these signs by the hundreds. Thousands. No, I mean hundreds a day. We had, they had records. How many did you do in one day one time over at Tom's? 350? 350 signs in one evening. And we had three places working like that. At my backyard, driveway of some friends. They'd have it on YouTubes, and it was just an inspiration for other people to do it. If you collectivize this kind of effort, if you focus it, if you say what the slogan should be, you're not going to get as much creativity, as much diversity, or as much participation. This is the one thing that I wanted to prove. This is the one thing that I wanted to demonstrate. This is the one thing that I wanted to make sure that people got to feel and see and live and experience. And I went all over the country meeting with young people in groups just like this. And you would have the average age would probably be about 50 to 65. But you would have the one little group table over there of 10 young people that were 19 to 22. And I always get up and I go, they say, oh, the, the uh, creator of the Ron Paul Revolution logo, yay. And I turn around and go, okay, who are the sign makers? I just want to know who the sign makers are. Who are the sign makers? Well, the young people would be like, well, we came here to make signs. You're not making signs. We thought you were going to make signs. Because they'd seen it on YouTube and they wanted to make signs. So I go, don't worry about it, I'll get, I'll get right with you. So I do my thing and I say, which one of you? I'd usually come on a Wednesday and there'd be some event that weekend that Dr. Paul was coming to. And I go, where are you? You guys got a backyard, you got a garage, you got a carport, you got anything. And I would go and I would bring the artwork with me and so on my laptop or whatever. From scratch, in less than a day, we would create the artwork, we create the stencils, we start making the signs, I go to the local outdoor advertising place, I get all the stuff, I go to Walmart, I get the paint, I sit them out there and I show them how to do it and go. 
What they made, by the time I got to Los Angeles, they had dozens of different kinds of signs and messages. That Stop Wars one over there, that's one of my favorites. Nick came up with that, right there. We just, we just, did, we just did this, what, a couple of months ago you came up with that. I'm going, oh, hell yes. You know, the Love Not War one, a lot of that was, you know, kind of targeted at Wayne Allen Root because he's kind of doing this war thing. So we were having fun with him at, you know, uh, an event that they were, he was at with the Republicans. So then you just take different, various different pieces and you put them together and you have fun. There are other things that we have done over a decade that sometimes we set it off to the side and we'll go, oh, we'll get to this later. Okay, this is a good idea. And we'll try it and be good. Oh, that's a good one. We'll, we'll put that arrow in our quiver and we won't overuse that one. Well, I'm going to tell you about just a couple of pro projects that we did and the national impact it had. I get a call a couple months ago from a friend of mine that lives in Fountain Hills. Fountain Hills is a community on the other east of Scottsdale that's just over the riser, just over the mountains there on the other side that opens up to, you know, just nothing. I mean, it's a beautiful valley out there when you go... Um, River rafting at the Salt River, you kind of go past out there, past the Fort McDowell casinos and so on, the Indian Reservation out there, totally undeveloped, except for this town called Fountain Hills. For those watching online, I'll explain it to you. Fountain Hills is a community that has homes, generally, that are on probably quarter to acre lots, usually, and uh, you have some other small multi-family dwellings, but mostly they're nice homes between four to 8,000 square feet, and they got some, you know, some cash. What they've done when they finally incorporated to keep from being annexed by Scottsdale, they wanted to be their, their own little collective, what they had is they had Rural Metro at the time, which was a private fire department. They would contract as individuals. I, you know, if my house is on fire, I pay a fee for you to come put it out. I don't pay, guess what? You just sit there and watch it burn. I make sure it doesn't, you know, catch your other clients on fire. That's just the way it was. Well, then you have um, trash pickup would be between five different companies are out there that collect their trash. And the, the, what some people would see as an eyesore, they would see on trash days, they would have, you know, the green, big green monster, you know, the trash bin that you have. And there'd be one that's blue. And there'd be one that's red. And there'd be a different companies. Oh, they're just not the same set of regimen and just polluting my eyes. I can't take it. I see freedom. When you see this diversity, you see freedom. They're so in their heads into this regimentation that we've got to have the same color trash cans. So what do they see? An opportunity. One of the big companies keeps lobbying, lobbying, lobbying. Eventually they get to where they get the city council. They're going to have a vote. We're going to decide that by such and such a date, you must choose this granted monopoly to this one company and if you don't, you're going to get fined. And, they, and then when it becomes government jurisdiction, they get to go through your trash. Are you recycling? Did you separate it out right? Are you using or you're defacing the receptacle? Are you, are you, are you, are you? First offense, I think it was $500. Second one, $2,500. Oh, you want to talk about making some cash. Oh, they, want, they, they, saw, they saw some money coming on this one. The people started getting all that heck no, this has been going on for years. You know, we don't want it, we don't want it, we don't, they don't care. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. So a friend of mine calls me and he goes, and he's known, he was, in fact, he was, his name, his initials are, um, well, I won't say, but <laughs> his name is R, all right? R calls me and he says, um, and, and I've done a lot of things with his money over the past decade and a half. As a young activist, I could change the planet for $2,000. You know, I get a few people, give me five. We started the first Ron Paul Revolution workshop with $2,500, of which 500 of it came from him. 